So moving on a little bit, um, tendon pathology obviously um, we'll look in a bit more detail now. So we, we find a number of different types of tendon injuries. So the three main types that we see, mid-substance injuries, and that's a, an accumulation of, of stretching forces on the, te on the tendon, surface lesions, and that's a, uh, because of compression beneath the navicular bone, and then insertional lesions, so, so tension um, on the, where the deep visual flexor tendon attaches to the, to the pedal bone. So they're the three main types of injuries that we see. Whereabouts do we see them? Well, uh, this is the this is a sagittal um, slice here, and the green line represents what the transverse image uh, is showing you here. So we often see them proximal to the navicular bone, within the proximal recess of the navicular bursa, or we see injuries over the back of the deep of the navicular bone. There, the um, compression and the fibrillation injuries that we see, and then more distally again, insertional um, injuries adjacent to the impar ligament here. So. Those three areas are quite important because they do have slightly different prognoses. If we see tendon injuries in the proximal recess of the bursa, that can often be more of a problem than the, than the more degenerative, quieter lesions over the back of the navicular bone. And insertional injuries, in my caseload anyway, can be quite problematic. Um, and so when we see those, we do get quite, quite upset about those. So these are the types of... of um, just looking at injuries more specifically in the types that we would see. So this is a mid-substance injury here, so, so classically what we would call a core lesion. So importantly, the margins of the tendon are intact. Compare that to this injury here, these are very nasty injuries. When we have that sort of prolapse of tendon fibres within the navicular bursa, so this is the navicular bursa here, that's fluid in the navicular bursa. This is the collateral sesamoidium ligament, which we'll talk about later. These injuries cause a lot of inflammation in the bursa, so they are secreting matrix proteins that are causing inflammation. While ever you leave that fibrillated tendon prolapse fibres, then you get this ongoing persistent um, burst of inflammation, which can be very, very painful. And then you have these insertional injuries here. These are often sort of myxoid degenerative lesions. They're like gelatinous tissue when you cut them out. They're um, very, very sort of... Um, chronic lesions mostly by the time that we see them. So looking at those, those all really require slightly different types of treatment. Those horses will probably show quite different types of lameness. So they're the main things that we see, but it's important to note that the tendon is often damaged at more than one site with more than one type of, of, of injury. So seeing things in isolation is a bit of a gift. Um, often we see these types of injuries where we've got almost the whole lobe is, is ruptured here. We've got a big insertional injury here. Injuries that... Um, that breach the palmar margin, they can cause distal digital annular ligament desmopathy. So they all have these slightly different appearances which are important. So we don't just have a deep flexor lesion or not. All these nuances are important to how we use the case, to how we manage the case. But I'll spend a little while on these dorsal margin lesions because you do see them quite a lot and they are one of the lesions that we can, can attempt to treat and usually we have to because they um, do cause quite a lot of ongoing lameness. So you can see the actual lesion themselves. This is all the same horse, the same slice position, but different um, sequences. So this actually looks quite good. I haven't really noticed too much about that. But if you look carefully, there's tiny little areas of high signal on the dorsal margin. When you make this, the, the fluid in the bursa go dark, you can now see that we've got these areas of high per intensity, these bumps on the surface of the tendon. That's granulomatous tissue that's formed because of the presence of those prolapse fibres. So we've got tissue forming on the dorsal margin of the tendon. Um, and again, this is just showing you the, the, this, this bright white fluid. So that's fluid in the bursa, that's causing a lot of bursal distension and lameness. When you look at those grossly, this is how they appear. So those bumps that we can see, you can see how they appear here. So they're little um, granulomatous nodules on the tendon. They, they function just to cause persistent inflammation. Um, now, um, really you have to remove those, there's not really much you can do about, about those. So your options are either bursoscopy or neurectomy. You can inject things into the bursa, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, and it can help for a while, but usually whenever you leave those structural um, abnormalities there, then you do seem to get persistent lameness. But obviously surgery, bursoscopy in our hands anyway, isn't as, perhaps as successful as other places, and I don't know, I don't understand necessarily why that is, but Often when you just remove that tissue, you end up with a fibrose bursa that's just stuck down to the deep flexor tendon. So it can be difficult. So we've 
we often try injecting things into the bursa um, to have an effect, and that can be anything from corticosteroids to this horse here is having a platelet-rich plasma um, uh, preparation here. So these are the types of injuries that you do really want to try and treat. So um, they're, they're slightly different from those large core lesions that you really just sort of can't do much about, but these you, you have to attempt some form of treatment, and I will talk a little bit about that later. Um, this is a horse, um, a little horse that, actually this was a pre-purchase um, MRI um, which we did, but this is a horse which is classic for these insertional lesions. So they're often, they, you see them often sort of reigning <coughs> horses and that, this horse was used for, for those purposes and they do tend to have this sort of shuffly gait anyway, but um, this horse has um, bilateral um, insertional lesions. So here's the, the little hole in the deep flexor tendon here represented by this high signal um, area from the stir here so we can see those those lesions quite nicely and if they're in the if they're in the center you can also see them very nicely on ultrasound actually having having berated that earlier um, so if you can see them you can inject something into them and again you can do this ct guided also um, many people actually do this through the bulbs of the heel i find that a bit traumatic for the tendon really quite difficult to to actually know that you're definitely in the in the lesion, so I tend to I prefer to visualise it ultrasonographically, and then you can make sure your prep is very good, by the way, obviously. But then you can insinuate the needle in there and inject whatever is the current um, treatment of choice into those lesions, and you can have some success with that. So once we've found the lesion, part of the job really is to decide how relevant that is. You will find that lots of horses walking around Yorkshire have got deep flexor tendon lesions and not all of them will ever have been lame or ever will be lame. So if we find one, we need to know is it relevant or not. Um, and we do that by looking at how they appear on different sequences to age them to a certain extent. We can follow them with time, so we can see if we, we have the first MRI scan, we can repeat that and see how it looks in three months time just to see how it's progressing. And there's also the potential for contrast enhancement um, uh, using standing MRI as well, which I'll just show you one slide of. The problem with looking at, image, at deep flexor tendon lesions over time is that they change very, very slowly. So they are almost always degenerative in nature. And when you MRI them, to start with, you very happily say, we'll come back in three months and we'll see that it's healed because I've injected something into it. And then you look at it again, this is the same horse with slice match sequences, and I've left the dates on all these pictures in case anyone wants to check that I haven't just put the same image over and over. Um, and this horse is, was slowly getting much, much better. And I could question was that causing a problem then in the first place, but these types of core lesions usually do. This was little, a little um, pony. Um, so, so clinical improvement sometimes um, it doesn't equate to what the how the MRI appears. So. I, what, what I, use, I used to suggest a lot of repeat MRI scans to see healing and I do that less now because sometimes the client thinks well it looks the same so you have to really be upbeat about why that looks the same and the fact that the horse has improved is far more important so um, it's useful in some cases but not all. Um, contrast enhancement is probably where this is going I think as far as assessing healing and also relevance of the lesions. Um, we, it, it's, it's more difficult than when the horse is under general anaesthesia because it relies on the horse not moving in between you injecting 60 mils of magnivis into its vein, which they don't all enjoy. So you have to do the, the pre-contrast scan, then you inject the magnivis into the vein, leave it for a minute or two and then start scanning and then you get the, the vessels are obviously enhanced now with the contrast material. And what we do see very frequently is that even when the deep flexor tendon lesion itself doesn't enhance, the tissues associated with it and the lining of the bursa often enhance um, very um, nicely. Now, what we then have to do is subtract one image from the other to see purely where the contrast is sitting, um, and that enables us to see whether or not there are vessels that are able to, um, that are associated with these lesions and attempt to, uh, to age them or, or on, on that basis. So how do, um, how do we manage them? I'm sure there's lots of people that manage these either similarly or differently and we're probably all um, doing the right thing. No one really knows, to be honest, what the best, how the best way forward is with, with these types of cases. But if the lesions don't breach the dorsal margin, so none of the fibrillation that I've showed you, then they get three months of controlled exercise um, or restricted turnout, depending on how lame they are, plus or minus an injection. Um, and that 
depends a little bit if we inject them or not, depends on how we can visualise them in many cases. Um, dorsal lesions with those granulomatous um, uh, tissue associated with them, usually bursoscopy or intraversal biologic agents um, and controlled exercise. Very few um, would get box rested, only the very, very lame horses are box rested. I usually put them in a bar shoe um, only with a graduated heel and only up to five mils if I'm going to box rest them. If I'm going to turn them out or um, also, if they're going to go into a large paddock or go back into exercise, I don't tend to put the graduated heel on. But if they're just going into a small um, 10 by 10 paddock, then I'll put a little wedge on them just for perhaps one set. Um, now, still, despite all the things that we try to do with these injuries, that when you see one, they're still depressing because they're either going to come sound and then go lame when they put them back into work again. Um, we do a number of neurectomies on horses with deep flex attendant injuries. Neurectomy is coming um, very popular again now that we can pick the cases um, quite nicely and it is it is an end stage procedure to do on a horse but it's also incredibly useful so it can get these horses back into work um, and as long as you've discussed all the possibilities and all the possible complications with the client doing a neurectomy in a horse with a very old virtually healed deep flexor tendon injury which has actually now got just other things in the burst that are bothering it um, that, that can work very well so don't necessarily rule out neurectomy in deep flexor tendon injuries is really the message.